Good morning. This is Tim Selden, president of the Montessori Foundation. With me at the moment is Kathy Leach, headmistress of the Renaissance Montessori School in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, we're going to be joined in a few minutes by my colleague, Lorna McGrath, who is going to log in. Um, Kathy, if you watch the background noise, because we're hearing everything you're doing there. Um, so again, reminding everyone, if you have any questions during the webinar, just go ahead and ask it in the little questions box, and it'll show up on my screen as a text. If you see the video going in and out, it's because I see there's a question and it may go off my screen and I may have to log out of the live uh, presentation of the PowerPoint. You'll see it go in the background so I can access what the question is. So today's topic is the Montessori Studio Program. Last week we spoke about Montessori all day and I just wanna remind you of the basic ideas. Uh, what we wanna do in Montessori is create family-friendly schools. Being family friendly means a lot of things. In fact, family friendly schools would be a great topic for a webinar in its own right. But the idea of being family friendly is trying to respond as much as you're able to while retaining an authentic Montessori program, designing programs that are designed to be supportive of your families. That includes thinking about the days of the week when you hold meetings, whether or not you run childcare, whether or not you offer summer programs if there's a real need, um, and such things as being responsive to families' feelings. For example, trying to, if mothers and fathers are not living together for, because of separation or divorce, making sure that you're communicating with both parents. It also, of course, includes the idea of an extended day, or year-round school in some cases, another great topic for a future webinar, and it can include what we call after-school programs or studios. So what we know is that many of us in Montessori uh, attract families in part because of the Montessori way of life and the culture we create in the schools. We also are often responding to Parents who are working, both parents, mothers and fathers, they're, they're needing longer hours and they, they don't want childcare, but on the other hand, they need support. And the idea of the studio program is in part to respond to that. Another part is that we're trying to be family friendly in minimizing parents' needs to run around town after school taking the children from one special class to another. Studios are defined as a program of optional after-school clubs, courses, and activities, primarily oriented for elementary and secondary students. And I say primarily. The reason for that is, in general, I think you'll agree with me, young children, uh, early childhood children don't move nicely from one class to another. That doesn't mean you couldn't have an after-school dance class or a, a, a young children's uh, soccer club or something like that. But I think you'll agree that some children do well in it and other children become overwhelmed. And we want to encourage you to design whatever programs you offer to meet the needs of the children that you're really working with, as opposed to simply responding to parents' desires to have you offer one activity after the other for your children. So some of you may find that in your school, studios work well for children who are kindergarten on up. And I realize not everyone listening offers elementary and not all of you go through middle school or high school, the point of this seminar is that it is essentially a program that is tended to be designed for older children. Now, most Montessori schools offer art, music, and dance, and movement in foreign language and other extracurricular programs. Parents would like us probably to have a poetry class and uh, junior debate and uh, science club and all kinds of things and they'd like it all to fit into the morning work cycle. On the other hand, that's the kind of thing that makes us 
crazy. And and in in offering these programs, we're trying to be responsive to parents' interests in having a wide range of interesting opportunities for their children to learn and grow. So from a parent's point of view, if you offer Mandarin Chinese, if you offer incredible art programs or dance classes, you're going to tend to be more appealing. So whatever it is you offer, you'll discover, I think, and probably have known for years, that parents tend to zero in more on your specialists, your extracurricular programs, and value them more than the Montessori program. That doesn't mean every parent feels that way. Quite often, it could be exactly the opposite. It could be that what they want is to know why their two-year-old isn't reading yet, why you're not sending home homework. That's a different conversation that we're going to have in a webinar coming up which is, you know, how do you have parents get it and can you really get them to get it? But today we're looking at these after-school programs. So on the other hand, we've got this interest in parents and in schools in offering lots of interesting programs which make our schools much more credible and valuable, but it tends to leave Montessori educators concerned and frustrated. Let me invite Kathy, and I don't know if Lorna has logged in yet, but if you're there yet, Lorna, log in. Um, let's chat a little bit together about this issue of how the normal weaving of specialist programs into the normal day tends to leave us concerned. Okay, this is Lorna, and I'm here, so. <laughs> Welcome, Hello. Lorna. Hey, glad to be here. Sorry I'm late. So jump in, either of you, if you have anything to add, or otherwise I'll just keep rambling. Well, I think um, you, your question about how it concerns us about weaving these programs in, and there's there's several models that, you know, as you, I love the word weaving them in rather than pulling children out. And I think that there's a really clear distinction. Um, what we refer to as the specials that are the pull-out programs uh, oftentimes means that children uh, during that, sacred three-hour work period in the morning will be gathered up in, in various um, groupings and pulled out of their work period regardless of what their um, their workflow or their work habits or what they happen to be concentrating on or, or even in a group project that they're pulled out to go to a art special or a music program or a foreign language or any of the things that we've mentioned that, that of course we know are valuable activities um, what what we tend to prefer is that either they're weaved in, as Tim was saying, and by weaved in I mean you may have a teacher who comes in and and just gives a lesson to a small group as, as the teacher might give to a, a math lesson to a child. And, and then the child's free to practice that lesson any time during the week just as they would any other lesson in the classroom. That's a, that's a model that is not as disruptive in the morning work period. And then there's uh, models where we're going to talk about where you can have these programs scheduled at the end of the school day, which gives children the option of choosing their, their specials, so to speak, and, and signing up for different programs, whether they be incorporated into the cost of the tuition or, or be an add-on fee. Right. Right. I think it's especially important at the early childhood level, but at all levels, to... Um, to not disrupt the routine. Those children at the early childhood level really like the consistency of their main teachers, their lead teachers, and, and their lead teachers are actually trained to provide experiences in music and art and um, physical, even physical. Lorna, I think we lost you. Have for that. Uh oh. I yeah, have you're, Lorna. You're, you have you're Lorna? Back, okay. You're back again, Lorna. Okay, good. Okay. I don't know how much everybody heard about that. The early childhood. Yes. We're talking about the early childhood and the teachers are trained somewhat to give some of these experiences. That's right. So they don't necessarily need a music teacher as such or a, an art teacher as such. Those should be incorporated into the curriculum at the early childhood level. 
at the elementary and secondary level, one of the things that we do at Newgate is we plan for those special activities to be um, done in the afternoons rather than during that morning work cycle. And then if they want even more, let's say they, they love art and they really want more art than what we can offer during the school day, then they can certainly um, take an art studio if that's what they choose to do. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, um, I think at the elementary level also, um, Lorna, is that you know the children as they're engaged in group projects and, and incorporating art and music into you know how they're mastering different academic skills even and, mm -hmm. and because it's such an integrated curriculum, the teachers do need to be prepared to um, enhance those skills and you know assist children with those. They're not teaching individual skills necessarily, but they are helping children utilize those skills to be able to complete projects. Mm, also, absolutely. Yeah, I also think there's a little bit of a danger that we have in always um, showing children, let me preface this, I believe children being exposed to people who are passionate, people who are passionate about art or music or, or taekwondo or whatever the thing is, I think children being in the presence of people who are passionate is, is exceptionally important. On the other hand, I think that if children only see specialists doing art or music or any of these other things, they tend to think you have to be talented in this area to mm. be good at it. And I think that that's a mixed message we want to be careful of. Yeah, I th everybody I'm glad you can engage that in out. these activities. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we've got a number of different issues here. One is that why does it concern most Montessori educators, whether they're working with early childhood or whether they're working with elementary, if the school has got lots of specialists and they want to cram them into the morning work cycle. We really want to protect the the integrity of children's having at least one extended, and extended usually means two and a half to three hours, not an hour, uh, really long uninterrupted work period, which doesn't mean that you couldn't have a second language program that's happening. I mean, obviously you could have a teacher in the classroom who only speaks in the second language and you've mm -hmm. got essentially something that's bilingual or it's integrated in. In the same way, you could conceivably have a visiting art teacher who comes in and refreshes the art environment and children are welcome when they see him or her to come over and see what new activity is being introduced into the classroom. But gathering kids together in a group is, is one of the things that we tend to be very reluctant to do, at least during the morning work cycle. And really in general, we don't want kids bouncing from activity to activity against their will uh, on some fixed schedule. Mm -hmm. We really want it integrated if possible. There's another concern, and on the slides you can see one of the concerns that many Montessori schools have is that if you don't watch it, you end up spending a lot of money on your art program, your music program, your dance program, your foreign language. And, you know, whether it's a lot of money or it's perceived to be a lot of money, um, the more of that you do, the more of a limited budget is going to that. Um, and we're not suggesting, again, that you shouldn't teach those things. We're just recognizing a reality that this can be one of the concerns. Another is scheduling different specialists among several classrooms can become a logistical challenge, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how the morning work cycle typically gets overburdened, is that the art teacher tells you, I'm only available on Tuesdays from 9 until 12, or I can't fit them all in unless I go into the morning work cycle. So, well, How about if they don't fit everybody in? Well, that too. And it, that's, again, where the studio program that we're going to be talking about really fits in. We're trying yeah. to address these concerns and challenges. So, yeah, you may not be able to fit everything in. And many people believe that they do. We've already talked about this third slide, the idea that if you don't watch it, all of these specialists easily end up interrupting the children's work cycle. And one of the, the penalties you pay for that is you normally don't see anywhere near the level of normalization, concentration, and deep learning. So the, the price you pay for making parents happy if you don't watch it is really serious. 
You just don't mm -hmm. get the self-direction, the concentration, the maturity of the children. So we really want to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then there's a fourth, which is if you don't watch out, the parents are going to pressure you to shuffle the kids from one specialist to the other, whether or not the child really wants to do it at that particular time. Mm, and that's right. We, we want to avoid that. And then yeah. finally, and I'm just going through a quick cycle and we'll go back to conversation. Um, quite often, many of the schools that we've all worked with, uh, parents tend to make snide comments and frustrated. Uh, they express frustration that the art program, the music program, the Spanish program is of rather minimal quality because quite often there's one teacher new every year and there's not a clear progression of skills over time. They learn the same Spanish lessons, you know, colors, body parts, and so forth. They're not really deeply learning a second language or any deep learning in art. So what we really want to do is avoid that sense of, you know, this school really, you know, talks a good game, but it's really not delivering. So the studio program model is designed to allow Montessori schools to enhance their, we'll call it extracurricular or the co-curricular uh, or the, the, the cultural programs while reducing interruptions. And we do it by moving specialist classes to the afternoon and to after school. And that's the key of this today's uh, webinar is this idea of the studio model, which is defined again as optional programs that are offered to parents after school. And we go one step further and suggest that ideally, these are built into the school budget and that there's a way to do it. And they're not the after school um, extended day program that parents are paying for, although they can certainly play a role in caring for those children. You're just taking the same budget you would have spent on during the school day and you're moving at least part of it to the after school hours. And one of the values of that is your school looks more valuable and interesting to the child and to the parent. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Now, let me rather just keep reading slides invite you guys to jump back in here. You know, we'll, you can see what's on the screen, but let's think about what are we doing with our after-school programs, our studio programs. Well, it's kind of, it it's, can be twofold. Uh, it can be that uh, children are given the opportunity to expand and extend some of the areas of interest that they already have um, and may even be experiencing during the day but want more of. It also, for the parents, um, at, our, at, at Newgate, um, children stay until 5 o'clock at night and many parents use that as their after-school care for their children. So the parents are getting a really big benefit. Their children are in great programs that they love Plus, they have those added hours so that if they're working or whatever they need to be doing, they can do those things. Um, and that is part of the tuition here at Newgate. It's not something they have to pay for extra. So, Kathy, Lorna, do they sign up in advance for those since they're not paying? How do you track um, how many students you'll have for each one and how many alternatives do you offer uh, sure. in a typical week? Sure. The studio program is only for elementary and secondary students. It's not for the primary students, although I'm sure that you could run some kind of a studio program. I just find it doesn't work as well for uh, the younger kids. Mm -hmm. So we haven't started studios yet this year. We're starting on September 15th. The parents will get a brochure in the, uh, on the computer. Uh, this weekend, which which is a pretty detailed brochure. It tells them how studios work. It tries to answer questions about studios for them. And then it lists each day of the week 
and what studios are being offered on those days. Of course, we try to have a studio on every day of the week for lower elementary, upper elementary, and secondary. And some of the studios do have particular age groupings. So some are open to all ages. Some are specific to certain ages. So we have to make sure that we have a studio for all of the children from first, first year elementary all the way through secondary. So we usually have two or three offerings per day. Some of the studios are more than one day a week. So for example, our running club meets twice a week. Our, um, our PE extensions only work, meets once a week. Um, the children sign up for certain periods of time. We change our studios about three times a year. And so they will be registering next week for those studios. And um, once a studio is filled, though, it's filled. So there's a big rush when I have the registration going on. Everybody's rushing into my office to get signed up for their favorite studios. There you go. We're starting to get questions. Uh, Josie asks, um, what about public schools where there is no tuition? What, how are you going to fund these kinds of programs? Mm. Seems to me that, Josie, the answer is, is pretty clear. Either you're going to uh, charge a fee, and they will be optional, or you do fundraising. Um, and one of the things we recommend to all public and charter schools is that regardless of whether you feel you need it to make the basic program work, you get serious about fundraising. It depends on, on what your community is like. You may have to turn to private donors. You may have to turn to various uh, other charities that may be willing to help you out. You may be looking for volunteers. I mean, not everyone who's running a studio program is paid. Quite often, they are volunteers, which right. doesn't mean that we don't recognize their issues. Anyone working with children has to go through the the security check, that you know, the police check, fingerprinting, and so forth to show they're not predators. But one of the other options, if you don't feel you can charge for your parents, is to try to get volunteers from colleges and from the parent body and from your teachers. Many Montessori schools that do this kind of thing and aren't charging are, are really doing it by getting parents and teachers and other people in the community to volunteer. And they don't run every day and they don't run until six o'clock at night and they don't run all year. Lorna, maybe you right. could speak to that at Newgate. I mean, how long is a typical studio session? Yeah, this first studio session is 14 weeks this year, which is pretty long. Usually they run anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks. And um, again, as Tim said, maybe somebody will only do one a year and not do the other two. And you'll find somebody else to come in and do something else. Uh, we had a woman who volunteered to come in from Joanne Fabrics at the end of the day and do a sewing studio. Uh, a couple of times last year. You just really have to have your feelers out in the community to see who you can find and among your parents as well. We have a parent this this studio session who's going to be teaching um, jujitsu. So that's a volunteer that we have. We also have certain teachers at our school that it's part of their employment agreement to do studios. So for example, our PE coach does a studio every single day after school because his hours are from 11 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. Our art teacher does one studio a week after school. Um, you know, so And that's written into their employment agreement. So we're not paying extra as such. That's just part of their job. Right. Now, again, We've got another question that came in from Karen who's saying, do parents who don't participate in studios complain about the added cost? And the answer, Karen, is it really depends. I mean, I suppose if a school decided to start up studios and, and added on a special cost for it, yeah, I imagine they might. But in general, what we would recommend is that you take this out of your budget. Um, now, again, right. some schools do have an activity fee. 
and that's part of the budget. Again, if you directly have the activity fee suddenly appear at the same time as you're running studios, you might get a complaint. We haven't seen that thus far. The bottom line is they're, they're normally free for anybody. Um, initially, we did not get tremendous participation, but we were doing it to try to get across the idea of the value of being part of our school, that we were different. And when I originally designed the experience back in the early 90s, um, we had a very small school with very few elementary children. And the goal was to give these children and their parents bragging rights, to give them a sense of being part of a much larger school. Another question that came in was from Josie Zeniger. Um, is aftercare provided for elementary and adolescent students before September 15th? Lorna, can you answer that? Yes, again, because our coach, is his working hours are from 11 until 6. During this time when we do not have studios, he provides aftercare for students that need it. They do pay a fee for the aftercare, though, um, during these interim weeks. Right, and there's, there is a... It's important to understand studios are not a guaranteed right. So it could be that on any given day or any given term, if you will, I think it's basically three terms a year. You could call it trimesters. Um, right. There might not be a studio on any given day that appeals to a particular child. We have a separate aftercare program, but the way it's worked out, at least here, is that children who are enrolled in aftercare are staying until 545. Uh, some schools, it might be 6, it might be 630. But the bottom line is, if you pay for aftercare, you're guaranteed that we'll take care of you, whether or not there's a studio. And then the studios stop, and they usually stop at about 5. And let's say we have a parent who's volunteered to teach a course in bookbinding or or chess, and they call up and say, you know, I can't make it today. And it does happen because these are volunteers. If that happens, we have to scramble and let the parents know that chess club won't be meeting this week because parents aren't paying for it. They understand. And it's not that I think they like it and we try to avoid it. And it's one of the issues as to whether we'll invite someone to teach a studio the next term is whether they're reliable or not. But certainly if they if someone does miss it, we would simply either cancel the activity for the day. And if a parent wants to, they can pay for aftercare on a drop in basis. Aftercare guarantees that we'll take care of you until the very, very end of the school day. Um, we have another question came in. Will you give an idea of the amount that we charge for the fee? Uh, is it possible for you to share the cost? for our after-school studio program. Lorna, would you uh, respond to that one? Wow. Um, the after-school program for elementary and secondary, they, they actually pay a different tuition, which is about, I would say, this is kind of a guess because I didn't do these numbers, but it's probably about $1,500 a year more than other students. And that guarantees them care every day. Plus, they get some extra days during like uh, winter break and spring break and conference days. Um, so they do pay an extra, an extra amount of tuition in order to be guaranteed care every day after school. As far as costs, um, the studios in general don't cost much. I mean, I think this year we added in a, after a number of years, we've done this since, again, the 90s, um, but we added in a activity fee, and that gives Lorna some extra money to hire some people, whereas normally it would have just been either own teachers or volunteers, and there really wasn't an extra fee. And, and this is a point I really want to get across. When you think about the typical school that's trying to fit art in, so you have an art teacher and you have so many hours a week that you need to get art in, you take that same budget, and in our case at Little Newgate, we had an art teacher who came in at the beginning of the school day and worked until 3.30. What we did is we shifted the hours and we had the person start 
just before lunch and continue on until six. Same thing with phys ed, same thing with many of the uh, the specialist programs that we offer. So to some extent, you're just taking the existing staff and you're changing their hours. Now, of course, some people who teach for you might say, well, I don't want to do that. And you don't just spring that on them. You would say to them in the spring before, this is what we're going to be doing next year. Would you be interested in continuing with us? So there's not necessarily a lot of um, extra costs for running these. The other thing to keep in mind is if you do offer a before and after school program, you've got staff that you're employing to watch those kids up until the end of the school day. Again, that same staff is part of the team that is running studios. Right. Got another question for you guys. Miss Lorna, can we have a copy of your brochure? Will it be on <laughs> Newgate's website? Um, Lauren, I, I, Tim, I thought you were going to sh show that to them or change it into a PDF for them. I'm going to actually, because it's so big, I'm going <laughs> to actually send it out to them as a oh, good. in two ways. One, um, and please take note of what I'm about to say to you all. All of you who are registered for this ongoing series of webinars, whether or not you attend on a particular week, because we know all too well what can happen. We record each session, we post it online, we send you out a weekly email letting you know what the link is to it. I'm going to look into setting up a proper channel so that in addition to getting the reminder about it, you'll be able to go there and look for the link and see the collection of webinars as it builds. This is just the third of the webinars in the series that we opened up to the general monastery community. And secondly, I'm creating a Dropbox for all of you who are, are registered for this. And in that Dropbox, you will be able to see various files that are collected for each webinar. And what we ask you to do is don't drag them out, because if you drag them out, you drag them out for everyone. Instead, copy them and, may, and take the copy for your own personal computer and have at it. So the answer, Patty, is yes, you will be seeing that a little bit later today. Um, by the way, if you have files that you want to share with your colleagues, you can put your files into the Dropbox and they'll be shared with each other. So please, whether it's this session or any other session, that's a great way to share information with your colleagues. Um, Josie is, is jumping in and saying, I think that it's reasonable to charge and perhaps a free or reduced lunch children are, are free or pay less. Again, Josie, running a charter school or a public monastery school, you have a, a very specific set of issues that you're working with. Um, I think for all of you, whether you're running an independent school and you're tuition based or whether you're running a charter or public school, um, I think that you just do whatever makes sense for you. For us at Newgate, and we're just one example, and Kathy, you haven't told us yet what version of this kind of program you run at Renaissance, we choose at Newgate to give it to people basically for free if we can. There are some individual studios that we do charge for, and Lorna will speak to that in a minute. But for us, the idea is to add extra value to bond parents and kids to the school more fully than we would than we would have if we um, charged for it. We just build it into tuition. Right. Um, so I'm starting, uh, boy, the questions are just right. piling on. Lorna, <laughs> you want to speak to anything before I give you the next one? Yes, I just want to say that we do have a couple of studios that we we don't charge. The, we ha uh, it's an interesting thing. We allow the Suzuki violin and piano uh, teachers from the Suzuki Institute here in Sarasota to give lessons at our school after school. We, as a school, do not charge the students. The Suzuki Institute does, and so we have them handle that whole business about collecting money and so forth. We don't collect their money for them. All we do is provide a space so our parents can can come here instead of having to come here, take their children somewhere else. They just come, they go to the lesson with their child, and then take them home. 
Another studio that uh, does a similar kind of thing is called Let's Rock Sarasota, and it is a rock band, and they come in uh, and you again just really use our space to work with some of our students and they handle the money part themselves. We do not charge for that, we just provide them space. So I just wanted to add that in. Sure. Kathy, can you talk to us about what you do at your school? Yeah, something similar to what you're doing. We have an activity fee and so we're not charging. I would say, I will tell you that years ago we did charge. So it was really, it was actually an opportunity for the school to, to produce some revenue. Um, but we had a bigger program and so more children were involved in it and we didn't necessarily need, um, you know, what Tim was referring to with that added value, which right now, you know, in the past years with the economy being very poor, having an added value has been really helpful for those older students. Um, parents have a lot of choices at the elementary level in our community, so that's been helpful. So we don't charge. We we will um, occasionally charge a materials fee or something like that if there's a um, you know an added expense. We we will charge something like that. But um, we don't we don't have as big a program, so we don't offer as many. Uh, studio options, so it, it averages like two days a week that there might be a, a chess club, a, a yearbook club, things like that that children can stay after for, and they are mainly um, uh, volunteers and staff who, again, have it in their contract. Again, a lot of this depends on the size of your school and mm -hmm. what, what percentage of your school is elementary and secondary or kindergarten and up. Because if you're very small, you're going to have you're going to have a smaller group to draw from. You may have a lower need. Um, you may also have some other regulations that get involved. For example, uh, Dr. Sean Ross has written to say in our state, which in her case is Kentucky, treats all after-school programs as childcare, which requires a director who meets state requirements to be present during the after-school time. How do you make arrangements for a director to be on site in addition to the specialty teacher? I guess one question I have, Sean, is does that person have to be one director for every every group? Um, for the moment, let's just assume we're talking about somebody on staff um, who is is there while these programs are going. Lorna, can you speak to that one? Mm. In the state of Florida, we have a similar maybe type of situation. Uh, because our early childhood program is considered uh, by the state of Florida daycare, we have to have a director uh, for early childhood. They, the director doesn't have to be on campus the entire time school is open. They have to be on campus the majority of the time. And quite frankly, you or I are almost always, one of us is almost always here until the very end of the day. The law in Florida does require that there have to be two adults present, even, even if there's only one child left on the campus. Mm -hmm. So we have two adults that always stay until the end of the day. But it doesn't have to be somebody with any kind of a special credential, such as a director's credential. Right. So obviously you're not just going to allow parent volunteers or, or groups that come in from the outside to work with your children under your auspices when you're in session um, because it's under your insurance and so forth. And that's a whole series of issues. One of the things we would strongly recommend is if you haven't already done so, look at the National Montessori Insurance Program. One of the advantages of that is not only that we've gotten Montessori schools treated as a separate group for the purpose of underwriting, it's that they also are specialists in understanding the challenges that we face as small Montessori schools. The reason I say that is child care centers tend to have a different set of insurance problems. Private schools are often much larger and much more sophisticated and have a different set of ways of responding to these issues, Montessori schools tend to be neither fish nor fowl. And one of the things that the National Montessori uh, Insurance Program can help you with is trying to avoid trouble. I can tell you that one of the advice elements they would give all of us is don't let anybody 
who runs a business like Suzuki Music Studio or anything else like that mm -hmm. come onto your grounds unless they have proof of insurance that names your school as being mm -hmm. insured in addition to insuring themselves. That's one yeah. of the many ways you protect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, again, for those of you who didn't hear it, uh, later today when I send out the link to the recording uh, to all of you, I will be, and you have to be registered. This is very important. In the past week, I was sending out an email to the entire 22,000 people on the Monastery Foundation uh, email list. And I'm not going to be doing that anymore. I didn't realize how much email people were getting. So it's only going to go out to people who are individually registered in this series of free webinars. Um, I'll be sending you the links to the Dropbox, and I'll be sending you the links to the uh, recordings, and I'll be telling you about what's coming up next week, but you have to be individually registered. I mention that because I'm looking at a few schools where it appears that two or three people are registered using the same name. Um, uh, and my advice, you can certainly do that, but the emails will only go out to the individual who is registered. Uh, and I don't know if GoToMeeting will uh, get funky in the future if we get too many people trying to use the same individual access. So for those of you who are encouraging staff members from your school to sit in or to participate, my advice is have them sign up, get their own individual link you know, we're not trying to do anything other than communicate with you about the webinar series. There are just coming in for us all. I feel like Diane Rehm on National Public Radio. <laughs> um, what is the annual tuition at Newgate coming from Karen? <laughs> Depends on the level. Yeah, an arm. Yeah, leg. right. And yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Because I feel yeah. like I. Okay, yeah, good. You can hear me. Um, you fine. Depends on the level and the program the child is in. For elementary students, it's twelve thousand four hundred and seventy dollars for the school year. If if they want the guaranteed aftercare, it's a, about a thousand dollars more than that. Um, for secondary students, if they are in what we call the first cycle, which is seventh, eighth, or ninth grade, it's thirteen thousand six hundred and forty dollars for the school year, and for the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade, it is thirteen thousand nine hundred and ten dollars for the school year. Thanks. Um, I have um, another question from Karen as well, asking. When you bring in these outside groups, do we charge the organization rent for the space? Um, I'll answer that one for me, and then Lorna, Lorna, you go ahead first. <laughs> well, I would say we should, but, but we don't. <laughs> we should, but we don't. Um, and we don't at this point just because we wanted to be able to offer a variety of things and also offer the parents that convenience. But I think as we move along, if we do bring outside people in, we may charge them a little something for using the space, but at this point we do not. And in general, my advice to you, unless you have gone out and set up a facility that's specifically for that, for example, Montessori in Traverse City, Michigan, um, I suggested to them many, many years ago, they set up a dance studio. They had a small room and consider partnering with a local dance studio. The reason why, in general, I wouldn't charge them rent is because it becomes very problematic if you have a formal lease program. Mm -hmm. uh, my advice is take credit for the program. <laughs> uh, be very sure that your insurance company is working with you. And I mean your insurance agent, which again goes back to why we so strongly recommend that you look at the national Montessori program. The foundation does not benefit from that, by the way. This is not, it's our secondary schools really need help. And a smart insurance agent, whether it's the national Montessori program or something else, you need that person to back you up. We ask them questions all the time. Um, so we, 
I would suggest that there are more problems in general renting out space than it is to have a written agreement that they can come and do it and take credit for it. You don't want, you want to be perceived of as the group that's making this happen rather yeah. than simply opening your doors to other people. Brand mm -hmm. it with the name of your school, even if it's done in collaboration with other people. Uh, another question to throw out to you guys, uh, Lorna and Kathy. Um, do any of you take, uh, or do we know of any schools that accept paying students from outside the school into your studios? Uh, this is from Cass, and she's thinking that that might subsidize the program. Oh, Kathy, Ooh. why don't why don't you talk to that one? Because I think we probably feel the same way. Yeah, I'm sure we feel the same way. Uh, I do think that um, it's exceptionally tempting, and it does you know help defray costs. Um, in my experience, it has not been successful for our students. That there's such a strong culture of Montessori within our uh, programs that it's very difficult for the other children to come in and mesh with them, and uh, you know to get that that cultural understanding that these children have been raised with that we have a culture of kindness and compassion that we have specific uh, protocols for conflict resolution. Um, grace and courtesy, just how we handle different situations that these children know. And we bring in studios that, um, and, and facilitators, whether they be volunteers or paid, who are taught to do certain things with children who are very receptive to this learning. So I'm not saying it could never happen that, you know, you have a good match, that some students might be good, but just sort of opening the floodgates and letting kids get bussed in and dropped off might not be your best uh, it may not be worth the money in my in my mind, yeah. you know, for our school. And I think there's another piece to that too, Kathy, as well, which is you need to look at the liability issues. Mm -hmm. if, I think it may be different liability if they're your students from your school than if they're students coming in from outside. So you really do need to look at the liability issues for that too. Again, all of well, this is also, pretty. Yeah, it's, Go ahead. It's not just liability. It's also um, there's different licensing, at least in Florida, right. mm -hmm. that we would have to be licensed to bring in uh, outside children for an aftercare program. So Ab mm -hmm. absolutely, and you all have to check with the situation at in your state. You want to look and see if there's special county or municipal guidelines. Chicago and New York, for example, have their own rules that are in addition to whatever the state does. Uh, usually, they'll be compatible, but not always. Make sure you know what the law is. And it depends on the nature of your school. If you're running a 30-child school, you're going to probably handle studios very differently than a school that's got 100, mm -hmm. 200, or more. Um, the bottom line is, mm -hmm. as, as offering these programs in the afternoon, you're extending your extracurricular activities beyond the school day, and you're making high-quality programs available to all of your students in place of the typically mediocre after-school child care program that many of us run. So um, we've talked a little bit about what do after-school studios look like. Um, Lorna, would you like to elaborate, though, on any other thoughts you've got about what has it been like after all these years to run these things year after year? <laughs> um, I have to say it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, but I think it's very, very enriching for the children. I think they love the programs. Um, I think my biggest thing that I still haven't quite figured out how to do it and make everybody adhere to it is attendance. You know, you've got these children that are going from their regular class day to a studio and getting those studio teachers to you know, take attendance every day, make sure they have the children that they're supposed to have. Um, that's, that's something you really have to look at because you've got volunteers coming in, you've got people from the Suzuki Institute coming in, and it's really important to know at that time of the day who's on campus and where they are. So that's a, that's a challenge I, I have found. And that would be the kind of challenge that we'd love to hear from you all on. From my experience, those of you who are running essentially early childhood programs and are designed 
more like a child care center and are using some of the software that's typically used in child care centers, you may actually have better strategies and know more of the software than we do. Uh, a year ago, I was really hot on the idea of selecting software here at Newgate to handle the checking in and checking out of kids out of concern that something bad would happen. Uh, we have been looking at it. We haven't found anything we particularly like. I suspect you will all agree that for many of us, unless you have a building that has controlled access. Now, keep in mind, Newgate is mm -hmm. on five acres of open ground. So it's not that right. anyone can wander in from any direction, but we don't always we don't have someone sitting there in the front and having these people log in and log off campus during the after school hours. So one of the things you may want to look for, and we will certainly look for and share with you if we find it, is some kind of app on an iPhone or an iPad or an Android that allows the teachers to take attendance and to make note of when the child leaves, whether they're going from the studio to the generic after school program at five until their parents pick up or from the studio to their parents or from the generic after school program to being log, logged off campus. The bottom line is all of us do the best we can to keep records. So certainly the generic programs have the typical paper and pencil, but I don't know what it's like in your part of the world, but we're in Florida. And if you keep this kind of stuff on paper and pencil, if you've got a notebook rather, it may get soaked in a, in a flash storm very easily. It doesn't mean an iPhone can't too, but hopefully, at least in Florida, people tend to have their smartphones in waterproof containers. Um, anyone else got anything that you uh, want to add to that particular issue of what does it look like to run studios? Not hearing anything more from Lorna or Kathy on that? <laughs> Let me just see what we said. So we've already talked about a lot of things that were in my slideshow. And this is what happens when you don't work with your, your co-host to plan it out in advance. We were also busy. So we've already said that studios typically meet once or twice a week. Um, you're typically going to offer several sessions, uh, several different studios on each day of the week. So the per kids day. have choices right. per day. Um, sometimes uh, you may have activities that are held after school um, and all kinds of activities. For example, we have German class and we have science science club and we have kids that are taking, uh, essentially they're staying after school for sort of a study hall or doing sort of math tutoring. That Odyssey happens. of the mind. Ah, they yes. I, that's a good point. Can you describe that for folks who may not know about Odyssey of the Mind? Mm. Odyssey of the Mind is a national program that schools can be can participate in. We have three teachers that will be working with students this year and it is a competition. They have a particular question that they are answering by putting together a skit or a machine or a, um, some other kind of way, a building. They might be building something to answer the question. And it's it goes along really well with Montessori because it's all about problem solving, teamwork, uh, co collaborative uh, thinking, creative thinking. And the children have to do the whole thing. The, the adults that are coaching cannot help them figure out the answer. They're only there to, to sort of make sure they're safe and help them think through their own ideas, but it can't come from the adult. And then they go in March to a state competition, and if they get that, then they may go to national competition. But it works very, very well with Montessori because of the goals for the program. I've got a great question that came in from Karen. Do studios do something to show sort of a, a culminating event, such as a, a concert or a gallery mm -hmm. show for art? Mm -hmm. um, I would say yes. I know Let's Rock Sarasota last year did a couple 
of concerts at different events that we had with our students in it. Sometimes our Suzuki students also will participate in our winter festival and things like that. Um, Odyssey, of course, those students go out and are in the world and are representing Newgate at Odyssey of the Mind. So yes, we do incorporate some of the things that they do in studio into presentations for other things that are going on. By the way, I apologize to everybody um, for for the picture going in and out. I've just realized a great solution. In the future, Lorna, Kathy, or whoever else is working with me, I traditionally I've sat here with two computers, one where I can see the questions coming in and one that I'm sharing the screen. Um, Maybe in the future, one of you guys can be the monitor and just jump in with questions from people that are asking them. Sure. Thank you, yeah, Karen, for that great question. You, yeah. you can't. Oh, that's important right. to know. So only the organizer can do it. Yeah. Okay. So otherwise, yeah, I'd be happy to help with that. All right. We'll have to figure out how to um, how to handle that in the future. Um, the bottom line is that these studios are intended to be enriching. They're interesting. Um, Newgate is, is uh, I think, a fairly good example of the kinds of things that schools can do if they really push it. If you go to our website, newgate.edu, or if you follow us on Facebook, you'll see the wide variety of international festivals, international children's festivals, or the annual youth opera, or the Shakespeare production, or the various, uh, the annual art uh, festival that we do every May. There's lots and lots of stuff here. But Karen, in answer to your question, while there are individual things like Let's Rock Sarasota and so forth that do specific uh, presentations at the end, it isn't necessarily something that always happens. There's just a, a sort of endless stream of things happening at Newgate. In fact, I know the parents often feel a bit overwhelmed because they're, you know, the kids are saying, I want to go and run in the race that's happening on Saturday morning. Please drive me there, or we need to be there early for opera rehearsal or whatever. It's all part of the life at it. So I think we've, we've just about come to the end of the hour. Uh, yes. Does anyone have any other questions that you want to ask? If you do, we'll be happy to grab it in the last moment or two. I'm going to make the picture go back out so I can see. No, nope, don't see any others. So I'd say that we've done a good job. We're um, <laughs> minute, oh. minute. Kathy and Lorna, thank you, you so much. You should have told everyone we were unprepared, Tim. Because yeah, really. <laughs> it seemed to work okay. <laughs> this is live theater. Um, it is. It's, and, it's what heads of schools do, and everybody <laughs> out there knows it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> By the way, for, for those of you who, who like what you hear from Lorna and Kathy, I want to remind you that uh, both of them are very uh, involved in the International Monastery Council and the Monastery Foundation, in addition to running schools. Um, both of them are frequent speakers and school consultants and uh, are more than happy to work with your school if you ever feel a need for someone to come and give a talk or do a um, um, presentation or help you with a project. The Monastery Foundation has, since 1992, been here to help. We were organized to help people who are running schools as curriculum coordinators or uh, monastery heads of schools or just senior experienced teachers who are trying to further their knowledge of Montessori. We really focus on monastery leadership and problems that are faced by schools and school leaders and senior members of the faculty. We're happy to work with anybody, though. So whether you're a newbie to Montessori or an old timer or someone like Sean, who is a, a doctor and a mom and a, a board chair and a very active member in her school or all the many people I, I know out there who are highly involved. God bless you all, because together we keep Montessori <laughs> schools running and keep the movement growing around the world. So um, one last thing is what's happening next week? And I don't know. Um, we've got several <laughs> things. We've got several things lined up. Um, and but we're I've been here waiting. to help. So what, is here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what does everyone uh, want and need? Well, originally it was supposed to be planned giving. But it's oh, not going to no. be planned giving next week. So I think I arbitrarily 
came up with a topic. And Lorna and, and Kathy, I hope you'll be able to join in and, and participate. <laughs> um, and if you can, you, you know, it's like Mission Impossible, if you can accept this mission. Um, <laughs> next week, we're going to talk about how do we how do we get the Montessori message across? How do we help parents to understand that Montessori works, that it's worth it uh, to trust mm -hmm. it? And is it even worth trying to change them? Um, mm -hmm. We're going to deal with some of those issues next week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, can't promise a brilliant slideshow. It may be more of a bunch of talking heads chatting with you about the real challenges. But the bottom line is whatever we come up with, it'll be from the heart. So this is Tim Selden along with uh, Kathy Leach and Lorna McGrath from the Montessori Foundation, the International Montessori Council, and the Newgate School in Lorna's case, and the Renaissance Montessori School in Fort Myers, Florida, in Kathy's case, saying thanks for joining us. It's been our pleasure. See you next week. Thanks, and everybody. Talk thanks, to you everyone. later today. Okay.